so this is an opportunity to dig down a bit deeper into um, some of the points made by, by each of the speakers. And just to sort of recap, um, I think uh, the, the presentation from Sylvie gave us an opportunity to see the value of GIS, strengthening the GIS culture in uh, MSF. How can GIS be helpful and what are the tools that are being developed through the GIS unit? Um, also from Pete, the sort of what's the base on which to build uh, the applications that we've been hearing about? So the missing maps, filling in the gaps that are so key to being able to do anything next on analyzing the spatial situation. And then lastly from Laura, a really good example of uh, a critical intervention applying the technology in the field in a fairly light way, I think you'd all agree. So um, I'm interested to hear from you, the audience in the auditorium and also online, any questions that you have or um, any points you want to raise. Thanks. Um, it seems to me a lot of this stuff relies on um, space-based technology in maybe two ways. One, the imaging and also the um, GPS systems. I wondered what it would be like to try and do this if that technology weren't available. So if we didn't live in a, kind of a world that had space-based technology. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, that's a great question to start with. Um, OK, let's, let's go from here. Shall we start with um, Sylvie? <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> so just to, to recap the question, um, you were asking, you were recognizing that a lot of this uh, work is based on the use of satellite data, space-based technology. So the question is, what would you do if you didn't have that data available? Is there another way of getting the same picture? I think your question. That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, and it's a big issue. Uh, it's a big issue, uh, especially in the equatorial country, where the, it's always cloudy uh, every month. Um, so I don't know if you ask this question, if you want um, us to speak about drone, because uh, the UAV could be uh, an option, but it's very expensive and you have a lot of issue about this uh, device, especially with the authorization. You can uh, be seen like a spy. So, uh, so far we don't have, a, well, in my opinion, we don't have a lot of uh, solution. Thank you. Um, I can share a bit of experience from Bangladesh. So the tracing of the slum was very, very inaccurate. That The maps that we took to base our field mapping on were wrong. Um, however, they were vital because if we'd started from a blank sheet of paper, which in some areas where there were no features to map from the sky, the volunteers really didn't know where to start. Like. The idea of mapping from scratch without this kind of easy access technology that we were showing them was almost unimaginable. I had no idea how to help them start. Like they didn't use maps generally uh, in the sense that in the sense that I had. Um, and so yeah, it's a really good question because if we hadn't been able to give them some sort of reference point that had been taken from above, even if it was wrong we would have been lost, and the, the two weeks we spent would have been spent mapping about one square kilometre, I would have thought. Great. Thank you very much. Laura, do you have anything to add to that? No, I just want to say that if, if, we, di if we didn't, we'd be in big trouble, because uh, for, in terms of response, you really need to have as much available information as quickly as possible, and I think if we had to people go out and try and sketch where they're going, yeah, that could be really, really troublesome. So I'm delighted that there's GIS experts who can... Uh, great these maps together and uh, put them together really quickly. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, any more questions? So we've got, uh, we'll take the one online first and then we'll come to the gentleman sort of in my direct line of sight and then the lady behind. Um, so I have a question for Laura from MSF Zimbabwe. Um, they're asking, so given the lack of trust at the height of the Ebola crisis, um, did you encounter any resistance in carrying out your activities? Quite the opposite. You know, uh, people were very, very motivated to partake and to give as much information as possible. Like, people want to be involved. I think Sierra Leone, the people in general, you know, they were very accepting of any help. And when you go to villages, they thank you for being there to save their lives. So there was never, never any issues with that. And that was, you know, people wanted 
to give as much information as I could. So that was a huge, I mean, they're, they're great people and they really tried to help as much as they could. Perhaps we can widen that question and ask uh, the other two panelists if you've had any resistance in any of the work that you've been doing on mapping more broadly. Um, I have the same uh, feedback. People are so happy to help and uh, are so happy to, at the end, uh, get the map of their village or get the map of their country. Okay. Thank you. Pete? There's been, we've, we've had situations where people have been suspicious of our intentions when field mapping, like walking around the tannery zone in Dhaka with clipboards. Showed us, you know, you can say this map is freely accessible. It's, it's open to anyone and it's open to anyone to edit, not just to look at. It generally persuaded people that what we were doing was creating a local map rather than imposing some sort of information from somewhere else. Thank you. So everybody loves a mapper. <laughs> Um, the gentleman in the middle. Uh, hello. OK. Uh, thank you very much for what everyone said. It's kind of a related question, really, on the issue of consent, which the keynote speaker mentioned at the start. Because it seems like there's, it's, it was very interesting to hear what they say about people going around very, being very positive. It's OK to use the satellite images, but as you say, the moment we start using mid-level technology, then we, start, then we start getting into interesting issues of spying or whether or not we should be doing this, shouldn't we do that. I mean, what, how do you... Uh, it's just, I'd just like to know a little bit more about how you get consent for kind of what, what, what you're doing, as it were. And if someone has a condition, be it MDR, TB or, or whichever, is that, are they... I mean, if they're not happy for everyone to suddenly be known, they're not happy to have a nice big red dot plonked on their village, how do you deal with that? I think we'll come to Laura. Yeah. No, so, I mean, those maps are not distributed <laughs> throughout the country, where, or these are the dots where people are villages. But, yeah, that type of consent, because it's really internal use and it's only really for the either the outreach team or for the epidemiologist, those are really the only people that see those maps. And then, then within the other organisations, you might distribute it, you know, to show them where the hotspots are. But in general, you wouldn't really get consent of the patient. But I mean, that dot is on the village. It's not the dot on the actual house of where that person is from. So it's just locating where where the, the cases were originating. But you know, in, in general, yeah, it's, it's just for us, it's kind of useful to know where it is. Because otherwise, then you're, yeah, because so many villages had, different, had very similar names. And you'd be kind of, it did happen that we were kind of going around one direction, then it's another direction. And you want to try and get there as fast as possible. So in general, I don't think people would have mind. And actually, when I was. When I was there, I kind of horrified it. The, there was actually no data privacy really at meetings if a case was, whereas MSF, we try to at least respect that. But other, you know, just at meetings, they're like, oh, this case came from this village and this person's name. So uh, in, in terms of Ebola, it's kind of a strange situation because really there is kind of very little data privacy, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sylvie, as, as a, somebody who's made maps for many years mm -hmm. and dealing with consent, what's your, been your experience? We, for sure, we didn't uh, ask uh, the, for the consent of the patient. But if you see the map, we never print a map with, uh, you know, the very exact location of the patient. It's always aggregate data. So we just produce map at uh, the very, uh, very small level, world level for free turn or community level. But you cannot go, you cannot zoom in to find the patient. Thank you. Pete, do you have anything to add there? Um, we, don't, we don't generally map patient data, but we've run into similar issues, and I'm sure this occurred to you guys, with village chiefs. So in Central African Republic, where the village chief lives is definitely a landmark, and people would describe their house in relation to the village chief's house because it performs a number of political and social functions as well as being where he sleeps. So you're essentially putting someone's private abode on a map if you include it in your base mapping. So we are in ongoing discussion with the OpenStreetMap community about how to tag that. So obviously it won't be tagged as a private home, but how to do that sensitively um, and you know, to, to respect that chief's privacy. Even though most of the chiefs do have a big signboard outside the house saying <laughs> village chief, which, you know. Thank you. Um, OK, we'll, we'll take this lady here and then back on to online. So, hi, thank you for your uh, presentations. Um, so mapping is, is clearly a very positive thing for the future, but I just wondered if, uh, 
it, there's been discussions on, on how um, the security of these maps may be protected from people who could use them in a negative way, especially in sub-Saharan Africa where you see uh, the movement of, of um, sort of war tribes uh, through the country. If they had access to this, these maps, you know, it could, it could cause great harm. And I just wonder how, as a community, um, this is discussed within your, within your profession. Um, looking to the future. Um, shall we start with uh, Pete? Shall we start with you on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, of course we've talked about this. OpenStreetMap is by definition open. There's almost no security we can put on... Well, there is no security we can put on OpenStreetMap. If a member of the military wants to download all the data for Unity State, they absolutely can. Um, it's, it, I think it links in a little bit with what Kenneth was saying, this kind of steamroller idea. OpenStreetMap is a growing platform anyway. Uh, anyone can add data to it. And so to say we're not going to map these places in OpenStreetMap because some people might have access to the data it kind of misses the point a little bit. And we also feel in a lot of these places that no map is actually a lot more damaging than having an openly accessible map. Thank you. Sylvie? Uh, in terms of uh, this kind of maps, as a mapper, you are not responsible for the data you put on the map. I mean, we are responsible for the reference data or the base uh, map like OpenStreetMap, but you, rec you are here to, um, to fill a request. So the owner of the data, I mean, the security officer, or I don't know, the, the person who wants a map with the um, army movement, or uh, I, I don't know. You, you discuss uh, with him how you, how you will produce your map, if you will publish it, or if you just print it and you delete your file or so, something like that. But th what is important is that you are not the owner of the, the data that people want to have on the map. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Laura, do you have anything to add to that? No, not, but it's sad that you have to think about these type of things. You know, but I think in general, you know, these maps are generated to help people, and then if people want to use them for other reasons, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just... Yeah, it's unfortunate, but I think, yeah, and they have to be open source, otherwise then people who really need it can't access it. So it's just, yeah. Thank you. The online uh, question. I'm sorry, just leading on from that, actually. Um, so given that these technologies, obviously based on GPS, drones, and aerial mapping, are strongly linked with military and um, sometimes perceived as, you know, um, espionage-related activities, um, could this cause problems, or has it caused problems for MSF? Um, perception or image of neutrality? Okay, so do maps cause problems? The technologies cause problems for the perception <laughs> of neutrality for MSF. Um, I think we'll start with Pete. Um, so not so far, uh, because the missing maps is a collaboration and it's an open public collaboration. It's not MSF dealing specifically with anyone in particular. It's a community of volunteers that are building a base mapping database for anyone to use. So it would be difficult to accuse a volunteer of, you know, colluding to, to create something when it's a, a very, very open project. Thank you. Sylvie? Yeah. In, term, uh, in the field and uh, in headquarters, so far, yes, it uh, doesn't cause any problem. The only thing I can see is a uh, satellite imagery. Um, sometimes a provider is also uh, like a, a U.S. provider or like a, a defense industry provider. So the question is open. Okay, so an open question there. Thank you. Um, we'll come now to uh, the lady in the middle with a blue coat. Oh, she's got the mic. Great. Um, how do you choose where to map? What factors, are, uh, factors affect where you start? So, Well, Pete. we're in the slightly fortunate position that we're at the beginning of the project, so there is a huge amount of space to map. So we have some, we have some friends in Heidelberg University who are about to embark on putting together an academic proposal for how to identify vulnerability and lack of map. But to be honest, it's not come up yet. Like, We've got all of Congo, all of Central African Republic, all of South Sudan, you know. There's enough work for us that we're fairly confident needs doing that, that we haven't had to think about that quite yet. Thank you. Sylvie? Uh, yeah. 
nothing to add. Uh, for example, uh, when you have the Nepal uh, earthquake, uh, the humanitarian open street path team is activated too. So uh, you can focus on some area like that. And Laura, how did you choose Tonkalili? Uh, well, that's where the EMC and Mike Baraka was based. So then essentially the, the team started Mike Baraka and, and just branched out throughout the district because there really wasn't much information. And they would just choose between themselves, the supervisor would kind of, they'd allocate chiefdoms and off they'd go. And they'd just go around and, and uh, start surveying villages. So when you don't have a lot of information, it's very easy to start because you just yeah. pick a spot and go. Yeah, so, and then it all starts to come together into a map. So then it's great. <coughs> I think we have time for probably two more questions. So we'll take the question down here and the lady in the middle. Thank you. Um, a question for Pete, but maybe also for the others. Um, how do you deal with population movements, especially like in South Sudan where you have big seasonal fluctuations and then you have mapped um, populations where that have, haven't been mapped before and after half a year when the rainy season's over or fighting season begins again, then you can start again, can't you? Yes, yeah, it, it, it definitely could have made it onto the challenges slide. So um, what, we, what we're sort of doing is providing a very much a general base map in places like that. There are um, other, other GIS services within MSF, such as with uh, MSF in Vienna, where they can do kind of rapid analysis of imagery to contrast the current base map data against new satellite imagery. So. Really, we're providing a, a baseline, and on top of that, we have to look at ways of measuring population movement and stuff like that. But it's definitely an issue because our, our imagery comes from different times of year, so you might have a piece of two pieces of imagery, both in Unity State, that are from June <coughs> and January, and they'll obviously give a completely different picture time-wise of, of how, how that place looks. So yeah, it's tricky, but there's, there's, no, there's no one answer, I'm afraid, yet. So separating out the baseline from situational analysis yes. and updating situational analysis when you can. Yeah. Um, let's come to the lady in the middle. Was that the question? OK, <laughs> fantastic. Do we have any more questions? Yes, the lady straight back. How do you curate all of this information that you're collecting? So Sylvie's talked a lot about requests, but do you go in the opposite direction? You, you know what information you have, but your people out there in the field might not know that that information exists. Sylvie, would you like to take that one? Um, if we have time, we can be proactive, but uh, this is not the case. So we are waiting for the request from the field. And um, yeah, we, we see which data we have, and uh, there is a big, uh, in GIS, in humanitarian community, it's a big network, and a lot of people are working uh, online, so you can easily find uh, update and accurate data. If not, we are also um, working very closely with the insti National Institute. Uh, when we are sending a GIS officer in the field, one on uh, one of his first tasks is to go to the National Institute, if it exists, and you can get uh, accurate data from there. Thank you very much. Pete? Um, so I'd say one of our missions is to make OpenStreetMap the go-to place for data in, in, these, in these contexts, because it, because it is by definition open and accessible forever. Um, once, if we can try and achieve a tipping point whereby it's the first port of call for NGOs to go and look for mapping data, then NGOs will also start contributing to this and updating the maps. And this will mean that we won't have to like phone operations people and say, have you looked at the data in OpenStreetMap or you know, email? At the moment it's very ad hoc, but hopefully they will gain a momentum of its own. Thank you. Can I add something? I'd, li I'd just like to say that when you get updates uh, mainly from the field, you, you print a map and the guy said uh, it's not what I have on the field, so you get an update like that. Great. Thank you very much. I'm sure that there are probably more questions um, uh, online and in the audience. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, um, although I could talk about maps all day. I know you've got other topics to discuss. I think that ho hopefully that has given you a taster for some of the valuable work going on already in MSF on GIS mapping um, and on the application of these 
technologies which are already in the communities. It's not introducing new things. It's making better use. More is more in different ways um, than, uh, than has been done before. So I think very exciting initiatives there. Lots of opportunity in the breaks to follow up on any of the questions or the points that you'd want to. But I'd like to say thank you to Sylvie, Pete, and Laura for a really interesting uh, panel session. And thank you, Liz, for chairing very competently and on time, uh, making my job uh, uh, easier. Um, I, I just wanted to, you know, when I was walking 10 years ago um, in, in the morasses of, uh, of, of South Sudan, I wished I had an open map, sort of, a, it would have saved me blisters, it would have saved lots of time, and we would, would have been able to do the nutritional assessments in a much better way than, um, than, than we had to do them. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you that we have um, online, we have uh, uh, people joining us from 69 countries. Uh, across five different continents. And these countries include Swaziland, Sierra Leone, PNG, Mali, Laos, Iran, Bangladesh, Niger, Myanmar, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Tunisia, and Senegal. So it's a, it's a there's, and there's more countries uh, there, of course, but it's a massive uh, online presence and that have uh, listened to uh, uh, this uh, great presentation. Um, uh, and uh, with that, I would like to uh, allow you to go for a break. Not before making sure that you're back promptly at 11.30, uh, so that we can start in time uh, for that massive online audience to be with us. Um, and uh, for the presenters and the chair for the next session to come down here uh, uh, and not to leave the room. Thank you very much.